This is something that is known to exist where there are uh, pathogens or pathogenic molecules, so harmful things that will move from the dirty guts, which naturally, you know, they're a little dirty. Um, that's, that's one of the points of interaction with the environment uh, where we are inject something from the outside is getting into the body. And so it's the role of the intestines to make sure that only what is supposed to come in comes in. And if something isn't supposed to come in, it stays in the guts. And so the intestines really do have an exquisitely well-built integrity to them to make sure that uh, to really do its, its job in keeping the dirty stuff out. Now, there are instances when that starts to break down a bit. And now you have things leaking in, and, and that's why we that's uh, where we bring in the term leaky gut. <clears throat> so uh, this is a phenomenon, uh, and it doesn't take a lot to find ample peer-reviewed evidence um, directly invoking those terms and then having uh, ample studies that uh, support the reality of it. When we talk about leaky gut, in the context in which I'm familiar with it, it is usually looking at the migration of a molecule called LPS or lipopolysaccharide. This is a remnant that is found on bacteria and it moves into the bloodstream and then elicits very strong uh, inflammatory responses. So this is a part of, um, of a bacteria that a cell, our immune cells, in fact, even more than the prototypical immune cells, fat cells will respond to this, lung cells, muscle cells. I've published studies on muscle cells that bind to this LPS. So LPS is a part of, of a bacterium that will bind. It's something that the immune cell or any cell will recognize. And then in recognizing that component of bacteria, it will initiate a prototypical inflammatory response. So this is the cell's way of saying, ah, I recognize you, you're a problem, and now I'm going to mount my defenses to get rid of you. So this is the molecule LPS that I'm very familiar with that is known to move from the, the dirty guts, if you will, into the clean blood. So it, it, normally there wouldn't be any of that moving across, but, but that it does start to happen. Really, it's not that the LPS is moving through the gut cells. It's that it's moving in between the space, uh, through the space between the gut cells. So we, bet, uh, when we have um, the gut cells, uh, that the, the cells that line the intestines, they are very, very tightly linked together through these a series of proteins that make a tight junction. They're actually called tight junction proteins, and they can become loose. So what is a normally a very tight junction becomes a bit of a loose junction. And now we can have molecules slipping through or leaking through, if you will. So the liver uh, is the first recipient of these things once it's moving from the gut. And the liver's the big downstream recipient. So when you have blood flow um, flowing through the intestines, it goes into the liver and then it goes to the rest of the body. So the liver's on the front lines. But in fact, saying that isn't entirely fair because the intestines themselves are on the, really on the front lines. They have their own very robust presence of immune cells that would attempt to mitigate these problems. But it does mean the intestines become more inflamed. There's more inflammation as they're trying to fight this invasion of LPS. And then what slips through the intestines will go to the liver, putting a particular burden on the liver. But it's interesting because the liver is also the site of the solution. When it comes to LPS leaking through the guts into the blood, it's a matter of, uh, it's naturally, we want to be mindful of what might make this happen more readily, or what might I be eating that uh, that is making my guts more leaky with LPS and other bacteria and pathogens. It's the two Fs, fats and fructose. Fructose increases LPS movement from the guts into the blood. And there's one study that we have linked here in the show notes, and it's entitled, it's in the Journal of Hepatology, which is a very good journal. And it was actually published just a few months ago. Fructose promotes leaky gut endotoxemia. Endotoxemia is just a nice word for saying we have a lot of pathogens moving into the blood and liver fibrosis. And there's more to it than that. Uh, the title gets a lot longer. This is published from a Korean group, again, in the Journal of Hepatology. And what they found in this study, that with fructose exposure on the cells or fructose consumption in the rodents, that the tight junctions became leaky. And now they had more of this movement of pathogen from the intestines 
and then into the bloodstream. Now, so that, that's kind of the, sim the simple side of it. And there, there actually is a lot, there are many more studies that highlight this. So fructose is a known cause of, of um, pathogen movement or leaky gut, moving from the guts into the bloodstream. And that might be why fructose contributes so readily to the development of liver problems, not only fatty liver disease, but also steatohepatitis, so inflammation of the liver and fibrosis of the liver, because it, not because the fructose, we typically think of fructose being relevant because it's um, coming to the liver and the liver has to metabolize it and it turns a lot of it into fat. That can certainly happen. But when we couple that with this information that fructose is all, also directly making the guts more leaky and exposing the liver more to these uh, pro-inflammatory pathogens, well, then it just really is compounding the problem. It's adding fuel to the fire. When it comes to fats, <clears throat> it's a little more complicated. Um, and, and there are different studies that have looked at this in different ways. One study that I want to highlight was, was very direct. They had these animals eating diets that were macronutrient matched, calorie matched, but it differed in the composition of the fats they were eating. One group of animals, and this is a study entitled Gut Mucosal Proteins and Bacterium are Shaped by the Saturation Index of Dietary Lipids. This is published in the journal Nutrients, a good journal, in 2019. And what they noted, in fact, I'll just read this section in the abstract. So I'm quoting, the corn oil diet rich in omega-6 polyunsaturated fatty acids increased the potential for pathobiont survival, so these harmful pathogens, and invasion in an inflamed, oxidized, and damaged gut, while saturated fatty acids, the demons of nutrition, promoted, uh, that was my addition there, okay. saturated fatty acids promoted compensatory inflammatory responses involved in tissue healing. So to sum that up, the diets that were high in polyunsaturated fatty acids, omega-6, so corn oil, that was promoting not only um, damage, physical damage to the intestines, but and maybe as a result of that, actual enhancing the survival of harmful bacteria and then allowing them to leak in. In stark contrast, the saturated fats, while also appearing to promote an inflammatory response, was actually promoting an inflammatory response that was gearing the intestines for healing. It was enhanced because inflammation is intended to solve a problem. That's why we can never just wage outright war on inflammation. There's very much two sides to it. It serves a purpose. And in the case of the diet that was high in the milk fats, the saturated fats, it was in fact enhancing the integrity um, of the intestines. So uh, uh, an inflame, an inflame, a measured inflammation that was actually um, enhancing um, intestinal recovery. We know, of course, that um, Diets that tend to be higher in saturated fats will also tend to increase total cholesterol. This doesn't always happen, but it often does. And there are, uh, within the family of total cholesterol, we will very often scrutinize the lipoproteins that are carrying that cholesterol, namely LDL and HDL. It's easy for us, and everyone says that HDL is just universally good. That's not necessarily true. We don't, uh, you know, there's some nuance there. It's easy, and or people universally say LDL is universally bad. That's, of course, not necessarily true, and I'll make that case quite heavily uh, right now. But what's so interesting about these lipoproteins is that we classically think of them as only moving fats around. They're carrying cholesterol, they're carrying triglycerides, they're carrying cholesterol esters, which is cholesterol with a fatty acid, but they are obviously doing more than that. So a couple studies to highlight here. Um, the first one was just published, enterically derived high density lipoprotein restrains liver injury through the portal vein. This was just, this was published in the journal Science, so a very good journal, and it was just in fact published a, a couple weeks ago. So how's that for recent data? And what they found was that the intestines can make HDL. So the, we typically think of HDL as only being made from the liver, but they found that the intestines will make HDL and that remember uh, the, as the blood is flowing from the intestines to the liver, because that's the way blood flow goes um, through that area of the body. As, as the blood flow is moving from intestine to the liver, I mentioned that some LPS, this main leaky pathogen will move through that. But also as the liver, as the intestines 
are making HDL, the HDL is flowing through that what's called the portal vein going to the liver and in the process binding up the LPS. So the LPS that's moving, if it were freely moving through the body, it would be binding cells and promoting inflammation. But in contrast, the HDL is there and it locks up the LPS, takes it to the liver, and then helps the liver then to dump it from the liver into the intestines to be excreted in feces. So the guts sensing this problem are providing a solution by creating HDL. Now, we don't know the conditions here. They're not getting into how to leverage that. I would say, well, whatever you can do to increase HDL in the blood is going to be a really great strategy to help enhance the binding where HDL is right there at the gut, ready to bind the LPS and remove it from the bloodstream before it ever becomes a problem in promoting systemic inflammation and insulin resistance. A lot of my postdoctoral work outlined the process whereby LPS causes insulin resistance via inflammatory um, pathways. So that's the HDL component. And again, a takeaway from that would be whatever you can do to increase your HDL is going to be a good thing. We all know, of course, that a low carb, high fat, high protein diet is going to do that very well. LDL, we know very readily is a product from the liver. And so while the liver is the first one exposed to LPS before it would then move throughout the rest of the blood, the liver is at the same time producing LDL. And again, we classically think of LDL as just being a problem in promoting atherosclerotic plaques. That is extremely debatable. What is much less debatable because the data are so clear is the fact that LDL, this lipoprotein carrying these fats also has on it like HDL specific, what's called LPS binding proteins or LBP. So there are these binding proteins that I mentioned earlier without giving them a name that are going to lock in the LPS and then take it to the liver. And then the liver will process it and excrete it through the bile duct into the intestines to be eliminated from the body. So LP, and this is a study entitled lipopolysaccharide is cleared from the circulation by hepatocytes via the low density lipoprotein receptor. And they did this study in rodents by manipulating the LDL receptors. This was published in the journal Plus One in 2016. So direct evidence in many, many other studies finding that uh, LDL will bind LPS. So while you are eating um, a diet that might be high in saturated fats and people will claim that's increasing inflammation without uh, evidence. In fact, there are studies from Volick and Finney showing that inflammation goes down, but you have LDL levels going up and that might be potentially improving the overall inflammatory profile in the body. We're talking about leaky gut, seeing it through the lens of LPS, this very primary um, leaky molecule that is moving and then offending the body. And LDL and HDL act as saviors in a way by physically binding this leaked molecule and then putting it back where it belongs, back into the guts, but at a point where it no longer has the ability to get back uh, absorbed back into the body. The final study I wanted to mention in, high, in highlighting LDL's role as an immune regulator was published in 2007, so this is a little older, and it's published in the Annals of Clinical Laboratory Science. The lead author, last name is Shore, S-H-O-R, and the name of the title of the study is Low Serum LDL Cholesterol Levels and the Risk of Fever, Sepsis, and Malignancy. They divided the study subjects into two groups, people with low LDL, which they considered at lower than 70 milligrams per deciliter, which is on the low end of healthy. But of course, a lot of physicians would say that's wonderful. Clinical markers would say, oh, your LDL is great. It's so low. And then the high was above 70, which I don't think is very high at all. Uh, but nevertheless, the group with low LDL demonstrated increased odds of hematological cancer, so like leukemia, by more than 15 fold. Now, let me just pause there for just one second. 15 times. So people with low LDL levels were 15 times more likely to have a blood-based cancer. It might be relevant that LDL is part of the immune system and maybe a sufficient LDL helps to stop this before it ever becomes a substantial problem. That's enormous speculation. Low LDL levels also increase the odds of fever and sepsis. Sepsis is a severe infection. This is when a person typically has to go to the hospital. So septic shock is, is part of this. So sepsis is a very, very bad infection. Of course, if you have a compromised immune system, that's going to happen much more readily. And indeed, the odds were five times. Again, that's a, that's a real number. 
uh, people with low LDL were five times more likely to have serious infections known as sepsis. Leaky gut is real. One of the main offending agents is a part of a bacteria called lipopolysaccharide or LPS. It passes from the guts into the blood, promoting inflammation throughout the body, also promoting insulin resistance. Fructose is known to enhance that movement or enhance the leakiness of the gut. Polyunsaturated fats are known to enhance leakiness. In contrast, saturated fats, there's evidence to show that they might in fact be attempting to uh, resolve that or improve the integrity of the guts. Once LPS has made it into the blood, the body has built in molecules to try to bind and remove the LPS before it can create these systemic problems. And this comes in the form of the oft-reviled LDL and the off-championed HDL, regardless, in addition to moving lipids around the body, which is how we typically think of these, LDL and HDL, they clearly have immune roles. And one of them is the binding and the removal of LPS from the body.